Welcome. The following is considered a standard part of the Algebra 2 curriculum, and I'm not really sure why. But here goes. Let's graph factored polynomials, and let's do this as follows. Suppose you're in one of these nightmare situations, I mean literally, that you uh, came to the final exam for a course, but you just realised that you never actually attended the course itself, if you got to go to the lectures. And suppose one of the questions on this final exam is, graph the following polynomial, which is factored into these linear terms. So let's do something like uh, x plus 10 cubed times x plus 4 squared plus x plus 2 to the fifth, say, times x minus 4, I don't know, to the sixth, times x minus 8 to the, I know, let's be crazy, 96th power. All right, here goes. You didn't go to the course, but nonetheless, you're faced with answering this question. Can I sketch a graph of this function? Well, just to grip for points, let's do the following. We at least draw a set of coordinate axes. We know it's going to be some graph of some kind. So here's the x-axis, and here's the y-axis, the vertical one. Now, if I look at this beast, um, I can ask myself, are there any interesting x values? And there are some interesting x values staring me in the face. For example, I know if I put in x equals negative 10, this term becomes zero, in which case the whole polynomial becomes zero. So right, I know, right away I know at x equals negative 10, the graph crosses the x-axis. Again, x equals negative 4 is an interesting x value. Put in negative 4 into this formula, get something times 0 times something times something times something. Again, at negative 4, the graph must cross the x-axis. And also at negative 2. So right now, I feel like I've got a few points without knowing anything. X equals 4 is interesting, there's another x-intercept, and x equals 8 is another interesting point. So the graph crosses the x-axis at each of those values. Great, there's a start. So I guess the name of the game now is just to keep doing this, trying to be intelligent without really knowing what I'm doing, and see if I can build a picture of the graph of this function just from basic sousing things out. Uh, putting in clever choices of x gave me the x-intercepts. Uh, let's talk about the y-intercept. Is it going to be positive or negative? Well, I won't work too hard at this, but um, suppose I put in x equals 0. This first term is going to be positive, 10 cubed. This next term is going to be positive, 4 squared. This term will be positive. In fact, anything to the 6th will also be positive. Negative 4 to the 6th is a positive number, and negative 8 to the 96th is a positive number. So I can now at least say the y-intercept will be 10 cubed times 4 squared times 2 to the 5th times negative 4 to the 6th times negative 8 to the 96th, which is going to be probably some huge positive number. So at least I know the graph crosses the, the y-axis as some positive value. All right, that was a good trick. Can I go further? Um, let's try another interesting value for x. Let's go to something extreme. What happens if I put x equals a million into this graph? Well, this would be a million plus 10 cubed. That's positive. This term would be positive. Something squared is positive. A million plus 2 to the fifth would be positive. When uh, a million minus 4 will be positive, especially raised to the sixth power. A million minus 8 will be positive, especially raised to the 96th power. So I'm going to get this huge positive number. So for extreme values of x, I know my graph wants to be a huge positive value. It must be going up like this. That's just me sousing things out. I'm just trying to be clever without doing any work. In fact, what's another good, interesting x value? How about the other extreme? So x equals negative a million. Well, now things are going to change slightly. If I put in a negative a million, this will be negative a million plus 10 cubed. There'll be a huge negative number that's actually cubed. That would now be negative. This guy will be something squared or stay positive. This guy was something to the fifth power. It would be a negative number. Negative a million plus two to the fifth power changes this to negative. Negative million minus four, well, that would be a negative number, but to the sixth power is still positive. Negative million minus eight to the 96th power would be positive. So the net effect is I get negative times positive times negative times positive times positive. So with x equals negative a million, I have a huge positive number. So again, the graph wants to go up and be huge and positive at the other extreme. All right, I feel I, I deserve half points right now. I've graphed this function. I know it crosses the x-axis at these particular points, these five values on the x-axis. I know it's positive at the y-intercept. I know it wants to be huge and positive as to go extremely to the far to the right. and wants to be huge and positive as to go extremely far to the left. Now it is, in some sense, connect the dots. But I've got to be a little careful. I don't really know what's going on between negative 10 and negative 4, say. So let me uh, examine this. Let's choose a number that's between these two. Let's say, I don't know, negative 6 or something. That's in between. Um, I won't actually evaluate the beast, but let me ask, will the graph be positive or negative if I'm at some point like negative 6 that is between negative 10 and negative 4? 
So here goes. If I put a negative 6 into this first term, this will be a positive number that gets cubed. If I put a negative 6 into this middle term, second term, that would be a negative number that gets squared. That would be positive. Negative 6 here, plus 2 is negative 4 to the fifth power. That's a negative number raised to the fifth power will be negative. Negative 6 to the minus 4 is negative 10 to the sixth power will be positive. Whatever well, this guy is to be positive. In fact, I don't even have to think about this. Anything to the positive even power is going to be positive. Positive, positive. I don't have to think about those once again. They're always positive terms. But for negative 6, which is between negative 10 and 4, negative 4, I can see the whole thing wants to be positive times positive times negative times positive positive. It wants to be a negative number. Let's try another value. Let's try between negative 3 and negative 2. Well, let's try, say, uh, sorry, negative 4 and negative 2, like negative 3. This guy will be negative 3 plus 10. It'll be a positive number cubed. It'll still be positive. This term, something squared, still positive. Middle term, negative 3 plus 2. That's negative 1 to the fifth power. It'll be negative. stays the same. Uh, negative 3 to the sixth power is always positive. Negative 3 minus 8 to the 96th power, always positive. So again, it wants to be negative. Twixt negative 4 and 2. However, between negative 2 and 4, well, I've already done it. It wants to be positive. Oops, I shouldn't put a negative 1 there. That's silly of me. It just wants to be negative there. Uh, twixt 4 and 8, let's try, I don't know, 6. Well, this term wants to be positive, 16 cubed. This term wants to be positive. In fact, it's always positive. This term wants to be 6 plus 2 is 8. 8 to the fifth power is positive. Put in 6 here. This wants to be positive. In fact, it's always positive. Put in 6 here. I get negative 2, but to the 96th power is positive. The whole thing wants to be positive. And what about between 8 and up to something extreme? Well, I can see already it wants to be positive. Well, there we go. I can tell that this graph wants to bounce between these zeros on the x-intercept. These are the only places where it crosses the x-axis. And it wants to be positive at the regions I indicate and negative at the other regions. So I can actually see what the graph has to look like. It has to be something like this that starts off being negative uh, in the negative extremes, wants to be hugely positive, has to touch the x-axis at zero. In fact, it wants to be negative next, so it needs to cut through the x-axis so it can be negative. Then it's got to go back up and be zero at negative four. And then it wants to be negative again, twixt negative four and negative two. So the graph must come down and be negative for a while and go back up to being zero at negative two. Now the graph wants to be positive twixt negative two and four. So the graph must do something of the following ilk. And then go back down to being zero at four. But it wants to be positive at this next range, positive between 4 and 8. So the gas graph must bounce up, be positive for a while, and then be going back down to 0 at 8. And then it wants to be positive again. So I can see that this graph must be doing something of this ilk. Now this is a very crude sketch. Um, to be honest, I'm going to be very strange. Most, most teachers now tell me off. They say, this is valid. Between 4 and 8 has to be positive. But we don't really know what the graph is doing between 4 and 8. It's just being positive. So if I felt like it, I have every right in my mind to draw the graph as follows between 4 and 8. Because I have no idea. Oops, why did that disappear? I have no idea what's actually going on there. So maybe the graph does something like that. That would be a valid interpretation. As a crude sketch of this polynomial, that's fine. In fact, if you study calculus, you will learn that the graph between 4 and 8 has to be just a single bump. But we don't know that at this stage. So if I was asked to sketch this graph, I would say, that's a fine feature. There it is. That's a valid sketch for that particular polynomial. Uh, let's try another one. Let's do a much simpler one. Let's not be as crazy this time. Let's erase all this. And we'll ask ourselves.